Welcome to this class about policy search and policy gradient methods in the context of deep reinforcement learning algorithms. There are two ways to introduce continuous action deep reinforcement learning algorithms. The first way is to follow the Sutton and Bartos book. So you start from the discrete state and discrete action reinforcement learning. You present dynamic programming techniques, then temporal difference algorithms. And this allows you to present Q-learning and Sarsa from one side, and then you can present DQN and Rambo by using some regression techniques. And from the other side, you can present actor critic techniques, and then by using again regression algorithms with deep neural networks, you go on to DDPG algorithms and its extension TD3. What I will do today is follow a completely different approach. I will start from a general perspective of what is policy search and then I will present the difference between policy search, direct policy search and bas basic policy gradient techniques and I will focus on those distinctions between policy gradient techniques before going into uh, state-of-the-art algorithms. Let's say that this video builds a lot on the deep RL bootcamp YouTube videos that are available following this link. This is in particular a video from Peter Rebill. And once I will have presented the technical background about these policy gradient techniques, I will go more deeply into the difference between what would I would call pure policy gradient techniques and actor critic techniques that are here. And that's only in a different video uh, in a different class that I will present the state of the art algorithms where here you have a complete view um, that I won't insist on uh, today. Let me also say that with this more complete, vi complete view you will also find on YouTube on my channel different presentation of the different algorithms in particular DDPG, uh, AWR, SAC uh, and TRPO, PPO. So let's first define policy search. To do this, I will take an example. For instance, consider a robot that you want to optimize so that it collects as many tennis balls as possible on a tennis court. So how can you do this? Let's first take a few definitions. So your robot is an agent. Okay? It has a controller. And your controller is a parameterized policy that I will write P of theta. Uh, how can you perform the optimization? The idea is to let your robot um, run on the tennis court. You observe how many balls it collects with a given trajectory. Then you change the controller so that it gets trajectories that will collect more balls. So to formalize this, uh, we need first to define an agent trajectory. So we will call it tau of theta and the return of the corresponding trajectory. So that's R of tau. And that return in that particular context is the number of balls that the robot has collected along a particular trajectory. And finally, we are interested in the global performance of your robot. So that's G of theta. And that's the expectation over, over all possible trajectories given the current controller of the return of that particular trajectory. The point is that you cannot compute this expectation because for computing this expectation you would have to run an infinity of trajectories with your current controller. So in order to go around this difficulty, what you will have to do is to sample the expectation. So you will just perform a set, a finite set of trajectories, and you will compute your return over the trajectories in the following way. In fact, you, you would like to know the sum of your, your trajectory of the probability of performing the particular trajectory given your controller parameterized by theta times the return of the corresponding trajectory. And that would be a good estimate of your global performance. Okay? So we are in a black box context. What we do is that you, we choose a particular controller. We generate trajectories from that particular controller. We get 
this estimate of the return g of theta corresponding to these trajectories and then we look for a better theta so that we get we can get a better controller to do so and that's the general approach of the policy of policy search now we need a method for finding a better theta so what can we do one idea would be just to look for theta purely randomly that would be pure random search okay so what you take is what you do is that you take a particular theta you compute the return that uh, you can get with this theta okay that would correspond to playing many trajectories with this uh, theta and if your return is the best that you have found so far you keep it otherwise you try another, another theta and another theta and another theta again and again and you do so until you have found a theta for which the performance is satisfactory enough of course this is not efficient at all if the space of theta is large and the space of theta is particularly large if your theta corresponds to the weight of a deep neural network which has many weights the idea is that this algorithm is very inefficient but it's uh, very general it's completely blind so it needs no assumption at all on the particular function that relates theta to uh, performance and of course this function you don't you don't know it but the point is that if you have some assumptions about this function and in particular if this function shows some regularity you can do better than using this very blind random search algorithm and that's what we will see now so that function did not show any useful regularity that we could use to find a better theta now consider that we have a function that has this particular shape of course we don't know this function but what we want to do is find the optimal theta that would be there or even some theta that would be there uh, if, if we can okay so we will show that in that particular context where you have some regularities between the performance of theta of particular thetas that are close to each other you can have two families of method the first is direct policy search what direct policy search does is the following you start from a particular policy p of theta zero okay which has some performance that you can measure just by playing it now what you can do is that you generate some random variations about this particular controller and you evaluate the performance of those controllers so that's the the, the controllers that you have generated that are close to that, that particular one then you will evaluate that performance that will give you those particular values okay then in a second step you will remove the controllers uh, that are less performant than the one you that you already know and you keep the ones uh, that are better that are doing better than your uh, initial controller and from those ones you generate a new controller for instance you take an average controller between those ones okay and you will get that particular performance so you get a new policy from the selected variations and you start again so from this new policy you generate new variations you remove the ones that are less performant you you keep those that are better and so on and so on okay so from what i have just shown you you might expect that this process will finally end up into this local minimum and it, and it will get stuck here but in fact you can be lucky if the variations that you generate are wide enough it may happen that most of the variations around this dot are lower but a few are a little higher and particularly if you get this variation here this one will generate an individual whose performance in here so if you keep just the ones that are above and you take an average you will get a, an individual whose performance is here and then after this step you will generate new variations that will allow you to move away from this local minimum and to go higher and higher okay so in part of these techniques uh, in fact we are using what is called the covariance matrix so as to adapt the width of the variations and if you are lucky enough with 
covariance matrix adaptation, you can escape from some local minima. So again, you are here and you continue iterating and you will quickly see that by doing this, you will move slowly and slowly until here. And of course, if those variations, if those local optima are la wide enough, and if you are not capable of generating variations that end up until here, you will get stuck into that particular local optimum. Okay, And you won't be capable of moving here using this direct policy search techniques. So those direct policy search techniques correspond to genetic algorithms, evolution strategies, finite differences techniques, etc. And in particular, in evolution strategies, you have the covariance matrix adaptation evolutionary strategy, which is one of the state-of-the-art techniques. Another one would be the cross-entropy method. Okay. And if you want to know more about these techniques, you can read this particular uh, survey. Now let's move to a different family of um, policy search techniques. This other family of technique is gradient descent. In the previous family, what we were doing is that we were taking some theta, making some small variation of theta, and evaluating the corresponding individuals. Okay, so we were so for moving from here to there, we, it was necessary to evaluate a lot of individuals along the path. With gradient descent techniques, this is completely different. You take, you start from a particular. Uh, theta, then you evaluate your function g of theta, you consider that you know this function because you will compute the local derivative of this function, and if you take this local derivative, you can, it can be shown that it provides the steepest descent here, this is ascent and not descent, okay? And you can watch my video about gradient descent techniques if you want to know why it's the steepest ascent in that particular case. So you take this particular theta, you compute a derivative, and it drives you to a different point. And then you follow the gradient with a step, and you do it again. And one point is that the gradient gives you just a direction, so you need a step size to determine how far you move. Okay. And if your step size is not properly tuned, what will happen is that you will end up into this particular local minimum because that's where the gradient will drive you. If you end up here, the gradient will, will uh, drive you back to, that, uh, to there. So you iterate until you find no more improvement. Okay. And if you get some stochastic variant of the gradient descent techniques, then you might escape from two local minima, but it's more difficult to escape from larger uh, local minima. So we have two families of methods with completely different properties. In direct policy search, you need a lot of samples, so you need to generate a theta and then to compute, the to evaluate this theta just by moving your robot onto your tennis court, okay? And you need a lot of, a lot of these samples to move from here to there. But one nice fact about those techniques is that you can more easily escape from local minima if you are using large enough uh, variations. And there will be a separate class about this topic someday. The other family is gradient descent techniques. Here you don't need samples at all, okay? But you can get stuck into local minima if you don't use uh, stochastic gradient descent. But the point is that, in fact, in the policy search uh, domain, you cannot use this technique directly because you don't know the function g of theta. To perform this gradient descent, you need to know the, this function so as to be able to compute this derivative. So what can you do? In fact, I will show you in the next slides that uh, you can, even if you don't know this function, you can reformulate this problem in such a way that you will be able to use gradient descent, and this will be policy gradient techniques. So can we move from direct policy search to policy gradient techniques? The important thing about direct policy search methods is that they just use pairs of theta and g of theta, and they directly look for the theta which has the highest g of theta. So that's very few information. 
In particular, it ignores the fact that the return comes from state and action trajectories generated by a particular controller parameterized by theta. And in fact, policy gradient techniques will use this additional information. We I will show you that we can use explicit gradients if we take this information into account by doing the following. First, we will represent a family of stochastic policies with these parameterized controllers. And we will look for controllers that produce high return trajectories by increasing the probability of actions producing these trajectories with a high return. The point is that these techniques are not black box anymore. They will need some additional information with respect to direct policy search. They will need to access the state, the action, and the immediate reward at each step. But still, the transition and reward functions of the underlying Markov decision process are unknown. So that's not a black box approach anymore. That's a gray box approach because you don't know everything about the system you are controlling. And from now on, I will start to, to go into mathematics. And again, I encourage you to have a look at Peter Bill's and Deep RL Bootcamp video, which is there because that's where I am inspired from. Okay, let's go into the maths. So, as a reminder, we are looking for the best policy parameters theta star, okay? And that's theta star corresponds to the best, to the, the theta that will provide the best cost function g of theta, okay? And g of theta, we have sh said in the beginning that this corresponds to the sum over all possible trajectories of the probability of this trajectory corresponding to a controller p of theta times the reward of the corresponding trajectory. So that's the expectation of return for a given parameter theta. So we want to maximize this expectation. And to maximize this expectation, we will use gradient descent. So first we have to express the gradient of g of theta over theta. So that's this gradient that we want to compute. So first we take this and we just apply the, the gradient to that. The first point is that the gradient of a sum is the sum of gradient. Okay, so I can just reorganize from there to there. Then I will just multiply by one by adding this term that is equal to one. And I will move this part, the denominator here. Okay. And it, and it happens that this corresponds to the gradient of the log of that probability. So that's just a property of the gradient of the log that it is equal to this, okay? And finally, if I look more closely at that particular expression, you can see that it's a sum of trajectories of the probability of this trajectory times something which is also a function of this trajectory. So by definition of the expectation, this term is the expectation of the over the trajectories of that particular part, okay? As I said in the beginning, you cannot compute directly an expectation over all possible trajectories because there is an infinity of such trajectories. So what we will do is that we will approximate this expectation over a set of trajectories that we will generate with our controllers. So finally, the expression of the gradient of the return for a particular theta will be the sum over m trajectories of that particular term and we divide by the number of trajectories so as to get something which is corresponds to an average. Okay. So we have a new expression for the gradient of the return, which is a function of this probability of trajectories. The point is that since we don't have an analytical expression for the probability of a trajectory depending on theta, we cannot compute directly this gradient because we don't know to compute the gradient of, of this. We don't have the analytical expression of the derivative of that particular part. And that's where the key point will appear. We will reformulate the probability of a trajectory using a particular policy with this expression. So this expression is very important. That's where we take the Markov assumption into account. In fact, we say that the probability of a trajectory corresponds to the product of a sequence of terms corresponding to applying the probability of applying action A in state S. That's the, here the controller corresponds to a probability of performing an action in a state times the probability of moving to a particular next state. 
given the state and the action that we have just taken. So if you think of it, a trajectory is just a sequence of the probability of taking the first action and going into the into going into the second state and then taking the second action and so on and so on. So that's just the product of all these probabilities corresponding to the subsequent states into the trajectory. And we have to be aware that when we are doing this, we are applying the Markov assumption. Okay. And in fact, there, are, there will be many cases where Markov assumption does not apply. This is why, in general, direct policy search is more general than policy gradient techniques because direct policy search does not make this assumption, so it will work even with Mar when Markov assumption cannot apply. Okay. It's more general also in the sense that it does direct policy search does not use, does not use sorry, the, sequence, uh, the sequential nature of a particular trajectory. Okay, we have reformulated the gradient over the return in this way and then in this way. Okay, and now we will continue the mathematical transformations. So if we take the log gradient of that particular expression, we can apply the fact that the log, the log of a product is the sum of the logs. So we transform this into a sum of two terms. Okay, and one point is that this term is completely independent of theta. There is no theta there. This is just the dynamics of the Markov decision process. So this does not depend on the controller. So if you take the derivative of this term with respect to theta, it just disappears. So in fact, this expression can be simplified into this just expression, okay? Because the first term was independent of theta. And if you again apply the fact that the gradient of the sum is the sum of gradient, you can get to that expression where you can see that in fact to compute the gradient of your performance, you don't lead, need the dynamics model anymore, you just compute it as a log gradient over particular policies. And that's very important because we know the analytical expression of a policy, okay, that's a particular controller, that's for instance a neural network that we know, so we will be able to compute that particular gradient. And that's the key to the next slide. So at the previous slide, I have shown you that you could transform that particular expression into this particular expression, so we'll now plug this expression into the general calculation of the gradient over the return, and you can see that this goes to that particular expression. And as I just said, the policy structure P of theta is known, so I can compute the gradient, the log gradient of that particular P of theta, and then I can compute this whole expression, so I can apply this gradient. Okay? And what is very, very nice with is that, in fact, I have moved from, from a problem where I could not compute the gradient because I didn't know about the structure of trajectories and by mathematically expressing the structure of these trajectories and their dependency to the return, now I can compute a gradient over that particular expression. So I moved from direct policy search on the performance for theta to gradient descent on the parameters of the policy here uh, after observing some trajectories that will give, you that, uh, give me that particular term. We will see later that uh, what I have presented so far can still be improved, but first let's have a look in practice as how to code for what I have explained so far. So the general idea is the following. We will take a given distribution of probabilities over policies, okay? And from that uh, distribution of probabilities, we will just generate trajectories corresponding to that. So we start from a first state, we perform an action, we get a reward, etc, etc, and we perform m such trajectories. Okay, then for each action in a given state, we will compute a return corresponding to the sum of the re returns over the whole trajectory. So one trajectory will get a return R1, another trajectory will get a return R2, etc. So we collect a set of m trajectories, we compute the resulting return as the sum over the returns of the uh, elementary steps, and then 
we have our policy coded for instance as a neural networks that represent a pr uh, probability of taking an action in a given state and for each visited state action pair over the whole batch that we have collected this way we apply to this neural network the gradient of that particular term that we can compute from this batch okay what does it mean that we apply this this term in fact this part is a loss function and we will compute the gradient over theta of this loss function over the network and that's exactly what uh, libraries such as tensorflow and pytorch are as good are good at okay so you define your loss function and you say i want to apply this loss function to my network and it will take care of applying this loss function so of computing a gradient so as to apply this loss function to all the weights of your neural network okay and if you do this given the equation that we have seen previously this will ensure that your return will improve over time okay so you do this you apply you compute a batch you applied the loss function to your um, policy this improves your return and you do this again and you loop until your return which is a local optimum or after a given budget and what you get is uh, probabilities of trajectories that are better than uh, initially okay that's the general idea now let's have a look more closely at how you can interpret this okay as i told you in the beginning in the beginning we were looking for the parameter theta with the highest return that would be there okay and we wanted to apply gradient this gradient ascent to that particular problem but we could not do this in that particular um, state because we didn't know the e analytical expression of the return depending on the parameter theta what we did with this particular expression that i have explained to you in the previous slides is that we moved from that space of theta and g of theta to that space which is the state action space and here you have the log probability uh, of taking an action in a given state okay and what we do is that we apply the gradient over theta of that expression so as to increase the log probability of uh, actions that give a high return so you can see that in practice the policy gradient is quite differently in terms of structure uh, from direct policy search because it searches in the state action space um, versus searching into the parameter space okay and for doing so it uses the structural assumptions that you have trajectories and that your problem um, validates markov property so as this expression shows increasing the log probability of rewarded actions so those that get a high return uh, will increase the uh, probability of the value sorry of the of the return and a different perspective is that in that particular expression you can consider the return this return here as the step size of a gradient descent so R of theta is the step size of each gradient update that you perform along a particular trajectory. So a bigger R of theta will result in a bigger update. So this explains that if your trajectory was particularly good, you will particularly increase the probability of taking the same actions again. Whereas if your return was low, you will not increase much the probability of taking that particular action. But one point is that I'm saying that I am increasing all the probabilities all the time if my return is positive. So what's happening here? So let's have a closer look into those details. In fact, as Peter Abil explains in his uh, own video, in the Deeper L Bootcamp video, all the probabilities must sum to one. So if you increase the probability of a particular trajectory, you will decrease the probability of other trajectories. So those that have a very high return will increase faster than those with 
uh, lower return and in fact in practice it will decrease the probability of trajectories with low return okay so let's have a look now into more details at different ways to re represent probability distributions to, uh, to uh, so as to get a better um, intuition of what's happening in practice so a very simple case of probability distribution if when you just have two actions that's often the case that is the case for instance with the cart pole uh, experiments or the continuous uh, sorry the discrete mountain car experiment where you just have one action which is to push left and the other action which is to push right okay so that's a binary choice between two actions so one way to represent probabilities with a binary choice is called a Bernoulli okay and your probability is the probability to take action A so the probability to, uh, to take action B is 1 minus this probability so if you increase that particular probability of course you will decrease that particular probability because the sum will must always be 1 okay. so as to represent those Bernoulli probabilities you need to make sure that the last layer of your neural network if you are using a neural network uh, will provide a value which is always between 0 and 1 so you can use a sigmoid or a hyperbolic tangent for instance okay and of course those libraries such as tensorflow and pytorch allow you to add a Bernoulli layer on top of your neural network so as to be capable of applying your loss function to that particular structure very easily if you have several actions let's say for instance you are in a maze and you want to move north, east, south and west you could use a categor categorical representation where you have one probability for each action and all the probabilities mu mu must sum to one okay? but in that particular case if you increase the probability of that particular action you should decrease the probability of other actions but there are different ways to do so so it's not so clear what to do if you increase that, prob that probability what to do to these ones one way would be to renormalize but this is not a very clear problem uh, you might think of different ways to perform this renormalization to one and finally a third case which is very common is when you have continuous actions in that particular case you will represent a continuous probability so you have your state of your space of actions here and you will have, for instance, if you use a Gaussian, which is the, the case here, you will represent the actions with the highest probability as some variance around that action with uh, this, this highest probability. And applying your loss function will move the highest probability action and may also move the variance if you want to, to do this. Okay, I will uh, go into the details of that in the next slide. So that's the case where your action is one dimensional and then if your action is multidimensional, then you will have a multivariate Gaussian, which means a Gaussian with several dimensions. And again, the uh, integral of your uh, Gaussian must uh, keep to one. And one way to ensure this is to keep the variance constant so that wherever is the maximum or the, or the highest probability the shape of the Gaussian is always the same so the, the integral is always one so to go into further details about this so you take for instance a, your neural network and the output layer of your neural network will provide the action with highest probability okay so your stochastic policy will be represented as a multivariate Gaussian using that particular expression okay that's the expression of a, of a Gaussian where Sigma here is a covariance matrix and mu is the center so the, the, the action with the highest probability so if you compute the log probability of that particular policy of course the log of the exponential is uh, okay the log cancels the exponential so you just take that particular formula if you compute the gradient 
over this log probability, you get that. So you will just propagate this thing. Okay. In what I with this expression, I consider a fixed covariance matrix. Now, if I change the variance, this results in more involved uh, de derivation. But the point is that, anyways, you you don't care because again, PyTorch and TensorFlow will provide you this calculation. So you just have to express your loss function, and it it will take care of applying these maths uh, without having you to deal about this. And I have a further slide to show that in the case where you just have one dimensional action, then the output of your neural network just gives you the maximum, the action with maximum probability. So you apply the simple Gaussian and in that case the calculation is even simpler. Okay, that was the general idea of how to apply this simple algori algorithm, uh, gradient descent algorithm in practice. After these practical considerations, let's go back to policy gradient techniques and show that we can still improve them. What I have not said so far is that if you want to the previous algorithms to perform reasonably well, you have to take very large batch of trajectories. The point is that your policies are stochastic, so the return you will take uh, heavily depends on which action you take in practice, and that's, that depends on your trajectories. So, in fact, in practice, we say that this algorithm will suffer from a large variance because it means that depending on the choice of actions, the return you get are very different and your uh, algorithm will perform well or not well depending on the run that you are uh, doing. Okay, so it has a large variance. So, in fact, what one point is that computing the return from complete trajectories are, as just taking the sum is not the best we can do. And that's what I will explain to you right now. As a reminder, the previous expression that we had for our gradient of the return was that. Okay. Here I am just re-expressing the return of all the whole trajectory into the sum of the return at each elementary steps. Okay, that's the same here. But this particular sum can be split into two parts. First, the part from time step t minus 1 and then the, the part with from time step uh, t to the end of the trajectory. So I uh, have I assumed that I had a limited horizon which was called h here. Okay. Now if we look more closely, one point is that the reward that we get here uh, okay, that the rewards that we uh, get here do not depend on the probability of actions after that step t minus 1. Okay, So if I take this probability times all that, in fact I can remove that particular uh, part of the equation because those rewards do not, okay, those actions do not affect those, par those particular rewards. So in fact I can reformulate this whole uh, expression which corresponds to a probability as just taking that times this because this particular part does not affect the probabilities here. So finally my expression for the gradient of the return comes this and this is a simpler expression because I am starting from time step t okay here and not from time step 0. So in practice, this gives me a new algorithm that I will call algorithm 2, where in fact, at the last time step, I'm just considering the last reward. At the previous time step, I'm considering those rewards, but I am ignoring what's happening before. So I will back propagate the reward from here to there, etc., etc., until I consider the probability of the first action. So I am playing those trajectories and back propagating the rewards to the trajectories. So that's the same as algorithm 1, but instead of summing the rewards at each step, for that particular um, probability I just consider the last reward, from that particular probability I'm just considering the sum of these two rewards, and from that particular probability I'm considering the whole sum, whereas in the algorithms 1, even there I was considering the whole sum of returns. 
Okay? And that's a slightly better algorithm, but we can still do better. Okay, what can we do? In fact, we can show, that's called variance reduction techniques, that by discounting the rewards along the trajectory, I can reduce the variance even further. So what I, what I will do is that I will apply to each local reward a factor gamma uh, multiplied by the current time step index. Okay, so that's, that factor gamma is called a discount factor. And if I apply this discount factor in the calculation of my um, returns, then my variance will get even smaller. And that particular term exactly corresponds to the Q function of applying probability P uh, in the state S. Okay, so the Q function corresponds exactly to the discounted value of uh, taking action I in state S and then following for policy pi. Okay. So I can reformulate that particular expression for my uh, return using the Q function this way. And this is a much more common way of expressing the policy gradient uh, in reinforcement learning. So given this new expression, I can change algorithm 2 into algorithm 3 just by adding this discount factor and now you can see that I, I will apply to each uh, state action pair uh, an expression that depends on gamma and the sum of the rewards uh, over the horizon and that results into an even smaller variance. But that's not all. I can do even better. What I can do is that I can subtract what is called a baseline to the calculation of my gradient. In fact, it is shown in several papers that we can subtract to that particular expression a baseline which is a function of the state, so a b of st here, without changing the mean of the, the gradient of the return, but this will improve its variance. I won't go into the mathematical derivation for that, but you can show that whatever b, applying this, you can change the mean and improve or uh, change the variance. And uh, the idea is that there are some maths to show you what would be the optimal uh, baseline so as to get the minimal variance. So a first baseline that would not be so bad would be to take as baseline the average return over all states of the batch. Okay. So if I calculate uh, my returns and then I renormalize them uh, by just subtracting the average and I divide by the standard deviation, so then I will get some variance which is even uh, lower. This is suggested in a different video from the DeepRL Bootcamp, which is uh, here, um, where they show you how to uh, do this in, in practice. So practically, what, we d what you do is that from the batch, you estimate the average immediate reward, its standard deviation, and then from all, um, for all probability of action given the state, you apply that particular formula. So that gives you these formulas, that's a little more complicated than before, but it suffers for even less variance than the algorithm free. So <coughs> this was with a baseline which consisted in taking the average reward. In fact, in practice, you can do even better. You can show that if you take as baseline the value function of following policy pi from the state st, then you will get a variance that is even lower. Okay, If you do this, then you get that particular form formula for the gradient of your return. And that particular formula, the Q function minus the value function, is known as the advantage function. Okay, So the advantage function of following a, a, a policy pi in state S and performing action I corresponds to the Q function okay, minus the value function. So that's the advantage function, and we get that expression. And that will be the final expression of the calculation of the policy gradient, which is the one that is used most standardly in uh, most, most algorithms. 
And you can find these derivations in that paper from uh, Williams, and that's an old paper, so 92. So in practice, the corresponding algorithm just needs to estimate the value function for the states, and we will see later on that we will estimate this value function with another neural network. Then from this value uh, function, we will be able to estimate the advantage function, and we will have a fifth algorithm which corresponds to the same algorithm as algorithm one, but you, we will use the advantage function instead of using the sum of the returns. And that's one of the algorithms that will suffer from the least variance from a standard policy gradient technique. And I will show you later on that this is still not uh, an actor critic algorithm because we are not using a bootstrap method to update the estimates of the V or the Q function, but we will just use Monte Carlo estimate. But that's for the next slides. So far we have studied various policy gradient techniques and shown that the one that has the lowest variance is the one which tries to estimate the function V or even or eventually the function Q uh, as a baseline which will provide a very low variance. The purpose of the next slides is now to explain how one can move from the policy gradient techniques to actor critic techniques. The first thing to note is that estimating the value function or the Q value function, so the, the, those two critics, this provides values even in unseen states. In fact, we don't use those values in unseen state in policy gradient techniques because we compute uh, the log derivative of the policy at the state and actions that we have experienced in the previous batch. But anyways, our critic can un and our critic can provide a value outside those state actual value function pairs. A different thing to note is in the algorithm which is provided in uh, Peter Bill's video. Okay, what you can see that is that here you will compute a new advantage uh, estimate and you will refit the baseline by minimizing the previous baseline, baseline minus the return. Okay, but you do this over all trajectories and time steps. It means that you recompute the baselines from all trajectories. And that's what it's a pure Monte Carlo technique. You could do something different. You could take a new trajectory and just update your baseline based on that particular trajectory. Or you could even update your baseline just based on one sample corresponding to one state action pair. And in fact, if the critique is estimated just based on the previous critique and some new information, then it becomes a bootstrap technique. Okay, And this will be crucial to move to actor critique technique. So <coughs> to make things even more clear, you, you have the, the, the following picture. So from this side, you have the Monte Carlo approach. What you do is that you have a batch of data, you compute a critique, you get a new policy, from that new policy, you get a new batch of data, and again and again. Okay, so the key part here is that you don't record a critique from an iteration to the next. And if you do this, you are not using a bootstrap technique, so you get an unbiased decimate for all st visited state action pairs using the current batch. A bootstrap approach is something different that's depicted here. In fact, you take a small amount of data and you compute a new critique based on the previous critique and that data. Okay? Then you get a new policy. From this new policy, you get new data, and you will again update your critique. So the key idea is that you record the parameterized critique from one iteration to the next, and you will update this critique. Okay? And the crucial difference that, we, it, that is very important for understanding the different performance of state-of-the-art deep reinforcement learning algorithm is that bootstrap techniques are sample efficient, but they suffer from bias, so they are very often unstable, whereas Monte Carlo methods are much more stable, but they suffer from variance and they are slower. So in practice, how do we compute those uh, estimations of the critique? In fact, there are two ways to do so. There is the Monte Carlo estimate and the temporal difference estimate. So this is the more mathematical way to see what I've just explained. So we define V hat and Q hat as estimators of the true critique corresponding to the current policy. You can update, uh, okay, you can compute your estimate V hat 
for instance, using the Monte Carlo estimate by taking the regression between the current value of the critic and the uh, empirical return. What's the empirical return? That's the sum of immediate rewards over the whole trajectory. So here you take your critic, you take what the whole trajectory says, and you perform a least square difference between the two, and you update uh, your critic this way. So that's uh, updating your critic through regression. Okay. A completely different way to do so is to use a temporal difference estimate. So what, will w what you will do this time is that instead of considering trajectory, you will consider just elementary samples, where each sample corresponds to the current state, the current action, the reward, and the next state. So what you do is that using those samples, you can compute the temporal difference estimate at that sample, which is written here, okay? And you will try to minimize the squared sum of those temporal difference errors so that it gets to zero. And by doing so, you will get the parameters from your critic that corresponds to the temporal difference estimate of your critic. Okay, so those two approaches are completely different. That's a Monte Carlo-like approach, and that's the temporal difference approach, which is also called the bootstrap approach, and which will correspond to actor critic techniques. Okay, and I have written those equations for V, but you can get the similar equations for Q, uh, quite obviously. By the way, those techniques are well explained in a uh, paper from Martin Riedmiller, which is also quite old. In order to even to pinpoint even more precisely the difference between being a policy gradient technique and being an actor critic technique, I have taken a few sentences from the new edition of Sutton and Bartos book, Reinforcement Learning and Introduction, so the new edition here, and that's on page 331. Okay. And it says everything in just three sentences. Also, the reinforce with baseline method learns both a policy and a state value function. Okay, the state value function. We do not consider it to be an actor critic method because its state value function is used only as a baseline, as a baseline, not, not as a critic. That is, it is not used for bootstrapping, updating the value estimate from a state from the estimated values of subsequent states, but only as a baseline for the state whose estimate is being updated. Okay, so in fact, here, if you are using a Monte Carlo estimate method, you are not actor critic. This is a useful distinction for only through boot bootstrapping, we do introduce bias and as an asymptotic dependence on the quality of the function approximation. So the key idea is that here that is that Monte Carlo estimate method does not have bias, so it makes a big difference in terms of reinforcement learning properties. Monte uh, again, Monte Carlo estimate is unbiased, but slow and rather inefficient, whereas t temporal difference estimate is biased and uh, sample efficient, but unstable. Now, how can you implement those critics? I am just coming back to the implementation part of this uh, class to show you that there are different structures for different critics. So if you want to implement the value of a state, that's a neural network that will take the state as input and that will have just one neuron corresponding to the value of that particular state. And you will train this using your Monte Carlo uh, technique or your temporal difference technique. If you are using uh, a Q function in a discrete action case, so that's the case of DQN, okay, you take the state as input and you have one neuron per action and each neuron gives you the Q value of being in that state and taking that particular action. So you will have a vector of values for each action, and if you want to choose your action, you just take the max over these values. And finally, if you have a continuous state and action problem, which is the case, for instance, with DDPG, you put as input to your network the state and the action, and you just have one neuron that gives you the Q value of that state and that action, okay? And I will show you in my video about DDPG how you can use this single value so as to perform gradient descent on the actor, okay? One um, empirical fact which is interesting is that, of course, this network is 
smaller. You have smaller input and just one output. But it's not necessarily easier to estimate because implicitly in the value you have a maximum over the Q values. So estimating this particular um, critic might be as difficult or even more difficult than estimating that critic. So let me summarize what we have said so far. I have shown you that the general um, equation for estimating the gradient of the return over theta is the expectation of something which is related to the return times the log derivative, so, sorry, the log gradient of the probability of taking an action in a given state. Okay, and now your term that you multiply in this expectation can be various things that we have seen during this class. A first pos possibility would be the total reward of the trajectory, so the sum of the immediate rewards, that's the total return. Okay. Another possibility is to take a discounted sum of rewards just after the current action, so you forget about the past. That was our algorithm too. Okay, let me say that it here I have inserted the discounted case everywhere, but uh, you can go to the undiscounted case just by taking gamma equal equals 1. Okay. The third possibility is to take the sum of rewards but after the action A, but with a baseline. Okay. And then, depending on your baseline, you will also have different algorithms. So, if you take, for instance, as a baseline the value function, then your term here is the temporal difference error. Um, if you take the Q function, then you get this particular way of computing. Uh, okay, you get you get a slightly different approach if you are using Q, Q values instead of V values. And finally, if you are using advantage function, uh, you you are using this value minus this one. And you have to know that this advantage function is equal to the expectation over the trajectory of the temporal difference errors. We now have a better understanding of the different policy gradient techniques and a better view that there is a difference between Monte Carlo-like methods and uh, temporal difference based methods which come to actor critic techniques. We also have seen a very important point, which is that Monte Carlo methods and actor critic techniques have very different properties. One is unbiased, but has a lot of variance and is slow. The other one is biased, so it's more sample efficient, but it's unstable. Okay. A different point that we will see now is that you can find a compromise between those two extreme techniques. So here I have represented Monte Carlo methods for estimating the value function. You take a complete trajectory and you estimate the value function based on the whole trajectory just by discounting from step to step. At the other extreme, you have the one-step temporal difference technique where you compute the value function at that state just based on the value of the next state. So if this one is a little wrong, then this one will be wrong too. This is why these techniques are biased. And in fact, you can do something in between just by saying, for instance, for computing the value here at that state, I will take a few temporal difference steps up to here, and then I get the value of the previous step. So that's something that is intermediate between pure Monte Carlo and pure one-step TD. So that's called n-step temporal difference techniques. And what is interesting is that by tuning the n of the n-step, you will be able to control a bias variance compromise. And I must tell you immediately, this will be important when I will present to you the state-of-the-art techniques, that most state-of-the-art algorithms are tuning this n-step uh, temporal difference, or are tuning the n in the n-step uh, temporal difference return, so as to get a good grip uh, on the bias variance com compromise. So what is this bias variance compromise? The general idea is that when you have a stochastic process with a model, there are two important quantities. One is the variance, the other is the bias. Okay. And in fact, the total error that your model is doing corresponds to the squared bias plus the variance plus some error that your 
model cannot um, decrease, okay? And uh, the situation is the following. The bigger your model, the less bias you have, but the more variance you have, okay? So a more complex model, so a bigger network, generally has more variance, but less bias, okay? And if you tune the n factor in the n step return, you switch from something which has very low variance, but a lot of bias, to something which has high variance, but low bias. And you will see that your total error will get optimal somewhere here, where the sum of the squared, vari squared bias and variance is minimal. Okay. So that's what we are trying to do when you are doing the end step return. There is a slightly different way of doing this, which is called generalized advantage estimate. So that's very well explained in John Schulman's paper uh, in uh, uh, 15, okay, 2015. So the idea is that the end step return can be reformulating using, in fact, a continuous parameter, which we call lambda. So uh, what we do is that the advantage function is now parameterized by two factors, the discount factor and this lambda. You can explain it, okay, you can write it this way. I told you that the advantage was the expectation over, over the temporal difference error, and here you just weight those temporal difference error based on where you are on the horizon, okay? So if you take lambda is zero, then you just have the, the sum of the delta, so that's the one step return, okay? In, in fact, if you have lambda equals zero, all those terms disappear but the first one, so the first one just gives you this delta t, okay, and that's the one step return. If you take lambda equals one, then the lambda parameter disappears and you have the Monte Carlo estimate, okay. So just by tuning lambda between zero and one, you get something which evolves continuously this time between the one step return and the Monte Carlo estimate, so it gives you uh, continuous grip on the BS variance trade-off, which can be a little more accurate than just using the discrete values for the end step return. <coughs> so to summarize all what I have said during this quite long video, you have different techniques to compute the value function and the Q function. Okay? You can use Monte Carlo techniques where you have no bias, higher variance, and lower sample efficiency. And there are two ways, which consists in using a pure batch Monte Carlo estimate, so that will correspond to the algorithm TRPO, or you can use one step, n step, or lambda return, so that will be an incremental Monte Carlo estimate, and that's what PPO does, okay? Or you can use bootstrap techniques. So in that case, you have more bias, you have a lower variance, you have a higher sample efficiency. So you could have a batch temporal dif difference estimate techniques, and there are there is no clear. Yes, in fact, there is one algorithm that does more or less that, which is advantage weighted regression. I will come back to that on the next video, and uh, you can have incremental temporal difference estimate using one step, n step, or lambda return, and that's the actor critic techniques. So, for instance. Uh, A2C, A3C, or soft actor critique corresponds to this category. So this makes many possibilities to approximate the policy gradient, because you have the six proxies that we have seen in the previous um, synthesis to the advantage estimators, just the sum of the return, etc., etc. But you can also use batch and step return, lambda return, one step temporal difference updates. So different ways to perform the update, different ways to compute the advantage estimators. So that, that makes a lot of possibilities. So you have a large variety of algorithms, which corresponds more or less to a large variety of uh, deep reinforcement learning algorithms in the continuous action case. So the take home messages of these videos are the following. In fact, there is a broad difference between direct policy search techniques and policy gradient techniques. In direct policy search, you perform optimization without a utility model and without knowing the cost function that you want to optimize. So it's derivative free and it has poor sample reuse and low sample efficiency. 
And in policy gradient techniques, you use the analytical derivative of the policy function, in particular its log derivative. You use the information from each step and not just from trajectories. You can use a baseline to reduce the variance of the policy gradient estimator. And when bootstrap comes into play, this becomes actor critic techniques. So what I have presented to you in this video is this whole part, this tree of different algorithms. I have told you that you move from direct policy search to policy gradient techniques by using the Markov assumptions. And then I, I have presented to you different categories of policy gradient techniques with different kinds of baselines. And in the next video, I will present to you state-of-the-art algorithms corresponding to these various possibilities in the trees. Thank you for your attention and don't hesitate to send me questions if you want to know more. Here is my email address. Thank you and goodbye.